I'm Brenda Ng, um, and my background is um, artificial intelligence. Essentially, I've been, um, I had my PhD in artificial intelligence way back, um, and after that, I joined um, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where I did a lot of um, applied um, machine learning, starting with probabilistic graphical models, then kind of jumping on the bandwagon of deep learning um, for about 15 years or so. And usually when you're, you know, 15 years in a place, they tend to have you also, you know, mentor the younger generation and lead groups and whatnot. So I, I did that. Um, and then kind of what Ken was saying, if he's still here, um, yeah, I felt like after 15 years, it was time for kind of like that change that I need to do something new. And so now I'm with um, JP Morgan with the commercial banking line of business doing more applied artificial intelligence. But now my entities of interest are companies instead of um, other more science related work that I did do at the National Lab. Amazing, thank you so much for being here today, Brenda. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Um, so I do have some questions outlined in terms of future of deep learning, but we do want to make this interactive. So if at any point you have a question that you want to ask about future of deep learning, anything of that sort, please just raise your hand and then we'll give you a mic to ask it. Also, if you feel like answering something, because I know we have a lot of expertise and experience in this room, please feel free to raise your hand then as well, and, and you can chime in on any of the questions I ask as well. Great. So let's just start with, uh, with uh, an easy one, I guess. <laughs> um, what recent breakthroughs in deep learning are you most excited about? Yeah, so before I answer, I want to just say that anything I say is my personal opinion. And since I'm, I mean, this field is growing so rapidly, and I'm kind of this one person that kind of stayed in one place for 15 years and then making this change to JP Morgan. So I totally welcome everybody's input, but what I'm about to say is really, you know, might just be more, um, you know, restricted to my experience. Um, yeah, so um, with respect to kind of like recent developments, um, I'm definitely looking forward to more uh, physics-based machine learning um, that I think our bear speaker, if she's still around, had alluded to where she talked about um, graph neural networks. Um, in fact, um, before I left for JP Morgan, um, we did work on some carbon capture projects where we are applying graph neural networks to learn um, fast circuits of um, computational fluid dynamics models so that we can better inform the chemical engineers about the efficiency of how they would design these columns that would take in the exhaust gas from you know, various industries and try to suck the CO2 out of them. Um, so I'm definitely very excited um, about developments in the physics-based community. And I mean, even though this is rework where it's more industry about like perhaps recommendations and other things, but um, for sure there's developments such as like neural um, ODEs, neural um, differential equations, essentially where um, Finally, the applied mathematicians and physics folks are also joining hands with machine learning practitioners to really try to fuse um, methods that they understand with harnessing the power of deep learning. Um, so that's one thing. So I kind of have a lot. Is, is that okay? That oh, please, please. <laughs> and, and for any one of you guys there that want to chime in too, like feel free. Um, other things I feel um, that I'm I'm going to really watch out for is um, with the advent of all these like huge models um, and of course industry wanting to um, leverage their power, um, with industry oftentimes we have more um, governance and, and we have to practice more, well everybody should practice responsible AI but in the industry more so because we have stakeholders. So I see the, um, the um, explainability work right in trying to make in trying to understand what is exactly happening within this huge model and to understand the deficiencies of them so that we can better um, perhaps you know, fine tune them with more novel ways of collecting um, relevant data to fill the gaps. So that aspects of it, um, while some of you guys that had you know, maybe 
read about explainability, the grassroots of it is mainly kind of focused more on like the visual. So for those of you guys know Captum, right? Like Captum is your like go-to um, you know interpretability library that you can plug in. But what about for the other modalities, such as you know language, also um, audio, right? Um, so I'm very interested in seeing how explainability methods kind of cross-transfer to other modalities. Um, let's see, other things that I'm really excited about, and I might be carbon dating myself a bit. Um, when I was young, um, if you guys remember, Microsoft had that like paperclip assistant. Oh yeah, okay, Clippy. okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> so for me, like the fact that people are now excited about using ChatGPT and also Dolly and creating work, like. I, I think to myself, like, if I can dream, you know, as, as you know, like, the moonshot goal is if I could have the, the paperclip assistant to, as I'm driving into work, you know, prioritize the emails that I have to answer on my way to work um, and be able to read them to me and also maybe even generate, um, you know, a, a response that is, like, you know, akin to my style because it's, it's using my previous email responses as data. And moreover, um, perhaps if I can also, as I'm whiteboarding with my team, um, as I'm whiteboarding, and of course, this has to be a special board that you know captures what I'm writing, it could even complete the rest of my slides. And as most of you guys here who had given presentations would know, creating um, Meaningful presentations um, actually take a lot more time than us giving it. So if we can also have tools to kind of um, you know fill in the blanks, and it is possible because there's Dali and like okay. other things. And so to answer your question, the the third thing I will be most excited about is really multimedia creative content that is tailored to um, you know increasing productivity. Um, I know creating art for fun is you know very fun. But um, since a lot of us are probably swamped with meetings and other responsibility, it would be super great to have a souped up paper clip that can do all that. So that's those awesome. are my three top things. That's a, that's a great answer. So just to summarize, the first one was uh, more around physics-based machine learning. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the cool things for me is I'm deeply in NLP, which has gotten a lot of attention, um, and also um, worked in computer vision mostly for healthcare. So I'm like very vis high visibility areas so everybody's excited about. So I think one of the cool things is just seeing other domains. Like I truly don't know more about physics-based uh, machine learning or how to incorporate that or video pre-training. So I think hopefully some of you also walked away with domains that you're maybe not as familiar with and, and just seeing the exciting progress that's happening across. Um, the second one you said was explainability. Just to tie it to other talks of the conference, we had some really cool talks around high visibility models. So somebody came and talked about um, autonomous planes. It was Arnie from Airbus. Again, I'm just like, I worked on machine learning for healthcare, chest x-rays. I was like, I don't know if I trust it. <laughs> autonomous planes, I'm like, oh. Um, so it's, it's really exciting for, for healthcare, for autonomous planes. Somebody came from Open Door, Sam, really talking about explainability and how important that is and how underlooked that is. So really good to highlight. And then lastly, I think the exciting thing as you were saying it is all of it is possible today based on the advancements that have been made. So if somebody here wants to have it as a weekend project and then contact Brenda, I'm sure she'll be more than or happy. Or have your own startup. Or you have, have your own startup, yes. but you have an early, early alpha <laughs> user right here. <laughs> um, any exciting trends anybody else wants to chime in on um, before we move on? Yes. Uh, Chris at the back will give you a mic. If, if I may, of, of um, course. All, all of these subjects are really interesting. And of course, you know, getting people's attention and acceptance is really important. So the only comment I have there is that I think a lot, all of these things are very well accepted. But, but remember, when Clippy first came out, people really hated it. Or at least many people did. I did. Maybe it was bad. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. You were saying yeah, that. I, I certainly hated Clippy because it was <laughs> annoying. Um, but given that you know a lot of the um, methods that's been presented, um, we definitely starting to see that um, the public is excited about it. Um, and if we can kind of channel all those models and have it plugged into the right places in a tech person's like or students um, kind of daily work stream and make it actually you know helping us as opposed to distracting us then I think we, we could have a real winner there. I don't know, I don't know if anybody from Microsoft's listening. <laughs> um, 
I see a hand up there. Were you hoping to comment? Yes. So I'm really amazed hearing like there's a <clears throat> red thread with a lot of ideas here. Uh, and we are trying to do that kind of clippy thing, but from a legal perspective only, like mm -hmm. uh, keeping track of your negotiations and mails and also uh, raising awareness on legal risks with what you're mm -hmm. discussing and uh, for etc. One obstacle that I would love to hear some thoughts about uh, now and how it is now and how it will be in the future is the amount of resources that's needed to train a model for an individual uh, use case. Uh, my understanding has been that the cost was very uh, high uh, up until recently, but it's still very high. Uh, is there an effective way to create an individual profile for people in order to give customized, I know this has been discussed many times and I've learned a lot, but I would love to hear it since you've been in these uh, thought patterns. Yeah, I, I almost feel like he knew your next question. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, anyway, good, um, good segue. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think um, it is very true that um, the amount of data that's required to um, adequately train a model to understand, say, a person's preference and preferences and, and whatever it is that your model is trying to um, address can be very daunting. Um, but as we have seen, like for example, in Jeff's talk, right, um, oftentimes um, incorporating human in the loop, right, through um, some kind of, well, even for chat GPT, right, there's that um, reinforcement by human feedback. So when I was on my way here, I was actually thinking about the same thought of like, okay, everybody knows that um, the amount of data is a huge bottleneck, but like, what can we do as a community, right? Um, I know a lot, I mean, of course there's the legal issues, but anything that you could share, if perhaps we as a community can come together and, you know, perhaps unify the schema um, by which we collect certain data. And of course, I understand different sectors um, would not be able, so medical cannot use like the physics people's data or not, but if similar groups can perhaps kind of form, you know, um, I don't want to say coalitions, but try to come up with a common schema so that we can um, possibly learn from one, one another. And that can also help, um, you know, um, further other grassroots ref um, efforts by other university or you know students, so that way they can immediately learn the best practice of organizing the data. Um, so I so to answer your question, organization of data um, would be important so that we can all share. Um, the other thing is um, definitely whenever you're, or at least when what I the way I would do things is I would always try to put things into an active learning framework so that I can quickly elicit feedback. I mean, oftentimes when we're in industry, you kind of want your model to be as best as possible before you push it out. But if your stakeholders allows it, it's always, in my opinion, again, personal opinion, um, just get it out there so you can elicit that feedback as soon as possible. Um, and the third thing is right now, the way that we're training is using instance-based kind of, well, what I say instance-based is kind of you have your label data, right? Um, what I would totally love to see is if we can also train, but also providing some higher up, um, almost like meta objectives. And by that, I mean, f most of you guys, when you train, most of you guys are familiar with TensorBoard and you know, you've been watching you know, your loss or loss go down, accuracy go up. But what if um, every time it does an evaluation, you also kind of throw at it a bunch of like, say, like tests that are not instance-based, but it's kind of, probing the model. Hey, did you learn your edges yet? Did you learn your like parts of you know, certain concepts that you're looking for, right? And so those higher level concepts is kind of akin to what the explainability um, community would kind of abstract out and, you know, and kind of take the features and project it onto more of a human, understandable concepts. So what I'm saying is, perhaps as we're going, looking at the tent support, we don't just train until it's way down, but we stop training when we feel the model has learned those higher level concepts. That, so as a result, I feel like training needs to be kind of changed in a way that we need to inject these higher level, um, I guess, um, requirements to them. 
Um, and that can also reduce, say, the carbon, impact, carbon footprint of you know, training the model to its end, because maybe oftentimes we don't need to, right? As um, you know, others have talked about with, well, Jeff's talk is still fresh in my mind, so I'm just gonna say Jeff. You know, um, there's often different ways to, there, he outlined a three um, kind of stage pipeline for his um, model. So sometimes it's good to kind of say, okay, you've trained, you understood these concepts now, now let me freeze you, and then based on, based on what other, you know, more um, specific problems I have, then try to fine tune, but using a different paradigm to kind of, and taking a page from you know Ken's talk, kind of like shake it around a bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I nice. guess it was a really long-winded answer. I, I hope that addressed your. Okay, great. No, it makes sense, and I can summarize and add to a couple of things uh, that you said, if, if that's okay. So I thought the first interesting thing you said was, well, we can leverage data sets across different organizations without maybe even sharing the data. Well, first would be getting it in the same schema. For healthcare, we actually kind of have something like that, exactly what you described. It's called Odyssey, O-H-D-S-I. Uh, it's basically they defined a common schema that organizations transfer their data into, and then you can run the same sort of script across different hospitals without ever um, sharing data. So it's like not really federated learning because you'll actually be training a model, but in this case it's just scripts. So I spent a wonderful summer uh, manually <laughs> uh, transforming our EHR data set into uh, the OMOP data set. But you should look it up if you're interested in healthcare and, and just interested in, in, in what Brenda talked about. Yeah, I also want to add, um, even if you cannot share data, it allows um, someone from a different team to quickly kind of get their scripts running. Because um, just from my own experience, oftentimes we get data from different sources and they really mean relatively the same thing. But then someone will have to do some you know, exploratory data analysis, EDA, to even like try to figure things out. But if everything is already in as common a schema as you can make it, it will definitely, even if you're not sharing data, it makes everybody's lives so much easier definitely. because then the assumptions of like what means what mm -hmm. is common and that will facilitate you know, everybody to be on the same page. Definitely, yeah, so sharing data across organizations. The second thing you touched on was, well, sometimes you just need to label your own data and you mentioned active learning. I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that maybe programmatic labeling is a better way to do it, quite honestly. Like one of our customers, a large pharma company, estimated that they had to use clinical scientists, in your case, lawyers, high value resources. Estimated it would have taken them 10 million uh, to label data, which they would have never spent. Um, but honestly, um, pr even outside of Snorkel, like the company, you could check out Snorkel, the open source project, and programmatic labeling, and it does speed up labeling quite considerably. Um, so just that. And then the last thing you touched on was, again, like explainability and, and how you can use that to improve the model. So all, all very excellent points. Um, maybe we do one last question from the audience, um, if you have any. Oh, yes, person at the end. Uh, my question is more about the foundations of deep learning itself. Where do you see, uh, do you see that we will continue to use backpropagation in the next 10 years, or could it be an alternative or a variant of backprop or something you know, far beyond? Yeah, I think um, people have definitely um, used deep learning to learn how to optimize. Um, so there's definitely new optimizers, um, you know, beyond backprop that is um, kind of being um, discovered and innovated on. Um, and with respect to training, um, you know, deep learning networks, I mean, right now we are using backprop and various, you know, tricks um, primarily because. Um, we know how to do them well, and also it's very much supported by hardware and whatnot. Um, but I, al I also feel that as we kind of get deeper into quantum, and again, I'm not a quantum expert, but as we have more novel hardware that is customized to other kind of um, optimization, um, that can readily change. Awesome, and with that, um, thank you so much, Brenda, for, for answering all these questions. Um, and that is the end of our summit. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. I'm sure Brenda will be around if you have another, a couple other questions for her. Uh, but really, thank you so much for attending. It's been a pleasure interacting with a number of you over the last two days and uh, just seeing the amazing list of speakers. So hopefully we'll see you next year. Or maybe there's another conference sooner. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all. <laughs>